Hello, I'm Mrs. J. Arthur Malone, but please call me Grace. It's late fall of 1919 here in Rochester, Minnesota, and we've been working for women's suffrage 71 years now. We are in the third generation of commitment to this great and needed reform for democracy. We still believe Susan B. Anthony when she told us, failure is impossible. But really, how hard can it be to convince American politicians to accept a constitutional amendment that says, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Carrie Chapman Catt, our national leader, has tallied this Herculean effort, what we have done up until this point. 480 legislative campaigns for state ballot issues. And of course, we only have 48 states, so you see how many times we have to do this. 47 state constitutional uh, convention campaigns, 270 national uh, state party convention campaigns, 30 national party campaigns, and 19 campaigns in 19 successive Congresses to get our amendments submitted today. Women in 15 states have full legal suffrage. And in 15 more can vote for president, but not in Minnesota. Although Mrs. Eulen, our valiant leader at the state capitol, thoroughly organized us by legislative district to provide local lobbying, and she has worked three successive legislatures, finally getting approval that we might vote in the next election for president, and a resounding victory in September of 1919 for the 19th Amendment, but still not total citizenship. We must be in the home stretch now that the 19th Amendment has been sent to other state legislatures. Many, like Minnesota, have passed it. But so many men, and even women, I dare say, ask, why do we want the vote? Can't we be content within women's natural sphere, raising children, caring for our homes, making a peaceful retreat for our husbands when they come home each day from their rough and tumble world? The answer is, no, we can't. Not when that rough and tumble world needs us, our voices, our perspective, our knowledge. The great social worker Jane Addams reminds us all that politics is simply housekeeping on a grander scale. Here in Rochester, women have joined organizations that work to improve the world, to improve the country, and to improve our very community. During the last eight years, our Civic League has raised awareness and then the funds to institute a visiting nurse, a day nursery for working women, alley cleanup, meat inspection, a restroom on Saturdays for women and children coming into Rochester to shop. If men had seen these needs, they had done nothing about them. And as our first Civic League president, Edith Mayo, said in her childhood essay, where you see one smart man, you see a dozen smart women. We are needed. For years now, we women have petitioned made speeches, written letters. Our state suffrage leader, Clara Ulan has letter writing groups ready to respond in every Minnesota county. But without the vote, women's work on the great issues of the day can simply be ignored. And let me tell you, it has been. Now that we are so close to victory in the long, long, long Votes for Women campaign, we need to transition to organize to organizing from persuading elected men to grant us full citizenship to persuading women to make use of it. This campaign has always been about justice, not privilege. The justice we can create with our votes, not just the privilege of having this right, as you can see. Mrs. Kilborn, my friend from Rochester, and I will be delegates to the very last meeting of the National American Women's Suffrage Association Convention in Chicago next February. That is when that organization will turn into the first Congress of a League of Women Voters. I have been appointed chair of the, in Minnesota of the first congressional district by the State League of Women Voters to provide citizenship training.
for the newly enfranchised. I plan to advertise in local newspapers and then visit every courthouse with informational speakers so women will understand the mechanics of voting as well as the planks in all the platforms of all the political parties. Unlike some political, political gatherings, these will be clean, dignified presentations conducted as a forum with opportunity for discussion and questions from the floor. New voters, and I dare say old voters as well, need to be armed with knowledge for the November presidential election next year. Because it is so important, though, to remember how we have got this far, I want to include information on this great struggle in these short citizenship courses, not just how to vote, but why it's important and why, how in the world we got this far. My hope is to involve the Rochester Magazine Club to provide living pictures portraying the history of women's suffrage movement from the time when the first woman dared to raise her voice on behalf of equal rights to the present time, 1919. And I understand that in the future there will be electronic ways called YouTube and PowerPoint to get the message across rather than living picture tableaus that are so popular today. In the meantime, let me fill you in, verbally and with photographs, on how we got to this point, starting in 1848 with the Seneca Falls, New York meeting. On those two days in July, in a small Methodist chapel, 300 people gathered at the invitation of Lucretia Mott, Frederick Douglass, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton to, quote, discuss the social, civil, and religious conditions of women. And they proposed truly radical ideas for the day. And I would suggest you go to your local library and get the minutes of that meeting. It's called the Declaration of Sentiments and, Resolution, and Re um, Resolutions. It is truly radical, so it may be banned in some local libraries. Lucretia Mott, this this meeting came as a result of a tea party between Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. They had met eight years before on a ship on the way to London. But Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton's husband, Henry, were both delegates to an abolition, campaign, uh, abolition um, meeting, an uh, international meeting in, in London, and it was Elizabeth Cady Stanton's honeymoon, but Lucretia Mott was an actual delegate. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was incensed on Lucretia's treatment. She was a delegate, so she sat on the floor. She raised her hand to speak. She was forbidden to speak. Then she was forbidden to sit on the floor with the male delegates and had to come up and sit with Elizabeth Cady Stanton in the balcony behind a screen because she was female. On the way home on the ship, the two women declared that they would start a movement for, for women's rights after that horrible treatment. But nothing happened for eight years except uh, Lucretia Mott finally called on Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who by that time had six of her seven children and was rather homebound with all those babies. But once she saw Lucretia Mott again, they determined they were going to do something about women's position in this country. And in fact, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a fabulous writer, and she wrote these with the help, of course, of, of Frederick Douglass. They ended their convention by stating, the 300 of them, the speedy success of our cause depends upon the zealous and untiring efforts of both men and women for the overthrow of the monopoly of the pulpit and for securing to women an equal participation with men in the various professions and commerce. There were 11 resolutions, including one, such as women have too long rested satisfied in the circumscribed limits which corrupt custom and a perverted application of the scriptures have marked out for her, and it is time she should move into the enlarged sphere which her creator has assigned her. There was one of the resolutions which was almost too radical for the group, the only one which did not get 100% backing. 
and that was, it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elected franchise. Lucretia Mott said to her friend Elizabeth, oh Elizabeth, I fear thee will make us laughingstocks. So even the fabulous feminist Lucretia Mott thought voting was a step too far. But Fred Frederick Douglass insisted that the vote was absolutely essential if women's rights were ever to be accomplished. In the Declaration of Sentiments, which was also part of, of this uh, meeting, it was organized the very same way as our Declaration of Independence was. And of course, this took place in July, soon after July 4th, so it was on everybody's mind. It included, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Following our list of complaints, much like our Declaration of Independence, which had a list of complaints against King George III, it began, the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. And of course, listing all of the facts. The one that jumped out to me as a married woman was, he has made her, if married, in the eyes of the law, civilly dead. Think about that for a minute. This was 1848, and we have certainly made steps since then, but some of these things are true. One of the famous women who did not attend this meeting was Susan B. Anthony. She lived in the area, but she apparently had not had her consciousness raised yet. I believe that's the term that modern women use. Even though, as a school teacher, she received 30% of the pay of man, and she did not have a chance for getting ahead. She had her moment of realizing something had to be done. Votes for women was what she decided. From her work for the abolitionist societies and the prohibition groups, she noted fairly rapidly all the work was being done by the women, but all the decisions were being made by the men. And she certainly wanted to put an end to that. And so she became a, a very good friend of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and the two of them worked wonders together for all of us women. But needless to say, the items in this Declaration of Sentiments were far from popular. They were just too out there. It's hard to believe how firmly held was the natural and subordinate place of women by both men and women. The view of women's sphere, being only home and children, was cemented in law, religion, daily practice, and culture. It's not only how things were, but how they were ordained to be. Those who questioned were ridiculed, intimidated, and even attacked because they were seen as undermining the linchpin of society. Even when a woman was grudgingly allowed to take a step toward the public or professional world of men, there was always a new hurdle. Think of Elizabeth Blackwell. She received a medical education before the War of Rebellion. But when Oliver Wendell Holmes, the president of Harvard University, proposed admittance of women to his medical school, the male students vehemently protested. And they wrote to vast acclaim, quote, we are not opposed to allowing woman her rights, but we do protest against her appearing in places where her presence is calculated to destroy our respect for the mod modesty and delicacy of her sex. The idea was dropped. Women might even receive a, a legal education, but the bar may be closed to them. Look at Myra Bradwell, publisher of the influential Chicago Legal News, who was denied entry to the bar because she was a married woman. Certainly married men were not denied entry to the bar. However, when needs arise, Public sentiment was able to allow women to work in public. Like when there's a war on, suddenly it's okay for women to carry on jobs that were denied them before. Or when men are too expensive or troublesome 
Think of the Lowell and Shirtwaist factory girls, far less likely to unionize than the men. Think of school teachers, when you can get women for 30 cents on the dollar and we have so many children to educate, of course, suddenly women can be school teachers. And more recently, typists and phone operators. Those jobs began as jobs for men only, but it turned out that men do not have such pleasing voices on the telephone as women do, and they're dainty, they do not have dainty fingers for typing. So suddenly, these became jobs for women. They became ladylike occupations, sort of like nursing. What in the world could be ladylike with being with all the blood and gore of dying men in the Civil War? But suddenly, since men wouldn't do it, nursing has become a job for which women are uniquely qualified. Suffragists, of course, to keep women in their place, suffragists have been depicted as old maids, failed women who couldn't get husbands in vicious cartoons, and I want to have you see some of them. This is a picture of Susan B. Anthony that was in a Philadelphia newspaper in 1876. You will see how mannish she looks. Of course, what they're trying to depict is what would happen if women had the vote. In the background, you may see there are women marching for the vote. In the foreground are two men who, of course, been feminized because women are taking over the masculine voting. One is carrying a baby and one is carrying a shopping basket. And I'm sure meant to be very hilarious is a picture of a woman dressed as a police officer. And here is a modern day uh, picture making fun of the gender role changing, which of course is what's going to happen if something as terrible as women voting comes about. Here is a poor man stuck at home doing the laundry while the woman, dressed as though she's off for a jaunt on either a bicycle or in her automobile, is busy smoking a cigarette and looking down her nose on him. These are the kinds of cartoons that, of course, were put forward to keep women in their place and remind women what their place was. Opinion writers and politicians said votes for women and would move them out of their natural fear, sphere and was a menace to the integrity of the home, wifehood, and motherhood. That is a quote from former President Grover Cleveland. Suffragists were not only attacked or intimidated verbally or by cartoons or in the media or from the pulpit. When a group of clergymen, can you believe this, clergymen, threatened a speaker in 1851 at a woman's convention, calling her an unnatural woman who didn't appreciate all the protections and advantages that she had as a woman. First they drowned her out, then they rushed the podium and may have done severe uh, physical damage to her had not Sojourner Truth been in the audience. She stood up and made her famous power, powerful speech Ain't I a woman, which turned the tide. During the recent Great War, I believe some of you refer to it as World War I, women who quietly protested outside the White House, carrying signs like, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty, were roughed up by men and boys while the police watched. The women, not the men and boys, were arrested for obstructing traffic they were jailed, where they were treated badly and force-fed. I'm sure you've seen the news stories how the college and society women were treated so poorly by the gentlemen who claimed to protect the fairer sex. And I will show you pictures of regard to that. Here is one of our members in a jail cell, and here are the women quietly protesting outside of uh, the White House quietly standing there. Of course, it was an embarrassment to President, President Wilson, but they were certainly fulfilling their First Amendment rights to protest. Besides these strong and oppressive cultural norms that we all know about, there are some political opponents to women's suffrage right out front. For one is the liquor lobby 
They obviously are sure that with women getting the vote, prohibition will be right behind the corner, around the corner. However, we have prohibition and women still don't have the vote. Southern states' rights and Jim Crow interests certainly don't want women voting because some women happen to be Negro women and they don't want any Negroes voting. Then there are those who make money off suppressing women and children by paying lower wages. They certainly don't want women to vote. Women might do something about their lower class pay if they had the vote. And incumbent office holders who have to be unsettled by the doubling of the electorate. So facing these odds, how did we win? First of all, we organized, just like Carrie Chapman Katz said, roll up your sleeves, set your mind to making history, and wage such a fight for liberty that the whole world will respect your sex. National work of her state-by-state -state campaign, as I highlighted earlier, was masterful, intense, but never, never ending. Clara Eulin in our state organized through hundreds of women's clubs that we now have, calling on all of us to make suffrage one of our projects. Many clubs in Rochester followed her lead, but organizing supporters was not enough, and the results were agonizingly slow. I would like you to see that we do have some results, but they are agonizingly slow. Here is a poster from 1912 that shows the state's in the West, where women have the vote. You can add New York also in this year, 1919, has the vote. But all of the East, the more heavily populated areas, have been denying women the vote over and over and over from the campaigns. But in the West, we are winning. We also have run campaign, PR campaigns besides organizing. Back from the 1870s, we have needed to change attitudes of those who did have the vote. At first, we had tireless speakers barnstorming the country. Susan B. Anthony went everywhere, including Rochester. She spoke in our town Christmas night, 1877. It was recorded in the Rochester Post. I quote, the women of our country, she said, the women of our country need the ballot to enable them to direct and control their business. Deprived of the right to vote, they are powerless in the enactment and the enforcement of laws, and they are at the mercy of the whims and caprices and prejudices of an oligarchy. She noted the effectiveness of the Grange movement and the thousands of petitions that were pouring into Washington, D.C. for a 16th Amendment. Are you understanding the irony of this? We are now on the 19th Amendment. She was hoping votes for women would be the 16th Amendment. We have had the 16th, 17th, and 18th, and still no votes for women. A favorite technique, of course, was petition drives, letters, and publications, even though these were often ignored by politicians, unless they were elected politicians from some of those western states that have equal suffrage. Clara Eulin certainly had us all writing those petitions during this past de decade. But you will note from, let's see if I can find the picture. <laughs> the Headquarters Newsletter. This was published in New York City in 1916 and 1917. It shows a cartoon of two women attempting to get their congressmen to support women's suffrage. One listens because the woman is from a western state. One totally ignores her because she is from an eastern state and she can't vote. Also listed are some of the many excuses they give for why women can't vote and we know they're all specious. And it, even though it appeared unladylike to many of us, to protest in public. We did it in the past decade. Before this amendment has passed, we had parades, which illustrated the strength of the movement and galvanized us supporters. 8,000 of us, organized by Alice Paul, upstaged President Wilson's inaugural in March of 1913. Wasn't he surprised when the press failed to meet him at the train station when he arrived the day before his inaugural?
because they were all busy covering the massive parade and tableau that we put on. And you will see from the picture how well organized it was. This was the handwriting of Alice Paul, who organized 8,000 of us in our fabulous march. She started organizing that in January for March, and she had 8,000 show up. She sold seats on the bleachers, which had been erected for President Wilson's inaugural, to pay for some of the beautiful work that she did. And here is a picture of the women marching. We always wore white symbol of purity. Our other color, of course, is gold. We often marched with our children. The final picture shows women handing out the various flyers. That was another way of having PR. Besides that great, uh, great show of strength, Minneapolis had 2,000 of us marching in May of 1914, including the Scandinavian Women's Suffrage Association. In New York City, Fifth Avenue was the site for many parades. Starting in 1912, 20,000 people then participated, again in 1915 and 1917. We employed, this was the visual culture of today, parades. We employed those. And we needed a new vision of what the woman of today is. We were tired of seeing those man-hating old maid pictures that typically showed up in cartoons. So women ran um, an art contest for a picture of the new woman. And here she is. This is truly us, rather than this. Besides doing PR, we of course looked for allies, as any political group would when we have a cause. Who do you think we could have for allies? Um, it was fairly easy to find those who wanted votes for women. It wasn't just a privilege. It was people who wanted justice in other areas, people who were demanding good government. Certainly there's enough government to clean up. People who wanted prohibition who wanted to protect children or women workers, or who were for public health. As I mentioned before, we organized through women's clubs, looking for allies in our cause. Here in Rochester, it was the Civic League, as well as the magazine and tourist clubs, and many others. And I must say, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was an important ally, and in some states, had 10 times as many members as our suffrage groups. And the growth in the number of college women had a large impact. And of course, they were also in clubs. There were many women's organizations and clubs discussing suffrage. As Clara Ulan said, you can never have too many clubs. This is where we learn public speaking, organizational leadership skills, and we develop sisterhoods. Of course, by now we have managed to find politicians who are supportive, partially due to the female suffrage in 15 states and female presidential suffrage in another 15. And President Wilson finally, through the parades and the pickets, which have swung public opinion, has helped lobby for the amendments passage in Congress after the end of the Great War. Some say, well, we're just lucky. It's finally the timing is right. Really? Timing? Abolitionists in the Civil War aftermath opened many minds to the rightness of women's suffrage. But it didn't happen then, even though Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony felt they had been promised by President Abraham Lincoln that the 15th Amendment would be for universal suffrage, not Negro male suffrage. But of course, he was assassinated. And those who were pushing for the 15th Amendment, mainly Republican congressmen, and of course, our, um, a an abol male abolitionist thought it was too heavy a lift to include women. Women will have to wait. It is the Negro's hour, totally forgetting that Negroes come both men and women. During the Progressive Era and the Prohibition activity, we now have the Prohibition Amendment. Many saw the need for women's votes, but it didn't happen then either. Finally, because of women's involvement in the Great War, 
Most Americans have begun to see how patriotic and equal women are because women have been operating outside of their natural sphere and the world hasn't come to an end. And in fact, women were very much needed. In all these periods, there's talk of liberty, equality, but fear of dramatic change. And as Carrie Chapman Catt has told us, the struggle for the vote is an effort to bring men to feel less superior and women to feel less inferior. Finally, we have had good leadership. Over three generations, there was some infighting, to put it mildly, but in the end, the various approaches to, of conflicting groups and women were what was needed to cross the finish line. Some were better speakers and writers. Some were better organizers. Some were more cautious of appearing ladylike. Some were more willing to be confrontational rather than count on the slow state-by-state -state approach. You've probably heard of Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the Grimke Sisters of South Carolina, Lucy Stone, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, Carrie Chapman Catt, Ida B. Wells, Frances Willard, Alice Paul, and in Minnesota, Jane, Jane Gray Swissholm, Harriet Bishop, Dr. Martha Ripley, Maria Sanford from the University, Clara Ulin, Nanny Jagger of the Minnesota Scandinavian Women's Suffrage Association, and Nellie Griswold Francis of the Every Woman Suffrage Club. But do you know who has been involved in Rochester? Remember, we are a small town compared to many in Minnesota with just 6,800 inhabitants in 1900, and now in 1919, we must be close to 13,000. Let me tell you about some of my friends and sisters and early suffrage sisters in the Rochester area, and I hope you are members of your family who have other suffrage stories will share them with me. First, Sarah Berger Stearns, Mrs. Ozora Stearns. In 1869, she in Rochester and her friend Mary Colburn in Champlin simultaneously held the first woman suffrage meetings in Minnesota in their homes and invited to a public meeting on women's suffrage. This is the quote that was in the Rochester Post in her letter of invitation. I invite, we invite those who can endorse this sentiment, votes for women, and those who would not ask so much freedom for woman that she should be allowed liberty of choice to vote or not to vote as her conscience may dictate. They are also most cordially invited to attend and listen to our reasons for the faith that is in us. In this earlier era, women's clubs were controversial, especially in the East and South, and no doubt in Rochester. Quote, homes will be ruined, children neglected, woman is straying from her sphere, clubs are an unspeakable menace, bellowed a, uh, a Boston news newspaper. Sarah knew about controversy and pushing the envelope. She met her future husband while he championed her admittance to the University of Mich Michigan in the 1850s. In 1870, she had a partial success. Our legislature proposed woman suffrage. 1870, if that had passed and gone into effect, we would have been only the second state or territory to have women's suffrage, following immediately upon the state of Wyoming. But Governor Austin vetoed this. Sarah had testified, as she had early, at earlier legislatures, with long petitions when nothing had passed. But the constitutional amendment for female suffrage, removing the word male from a suffrage qualification, was to be voted on by both men and women. Governor Austin found that that was unconstitutional since women did not have the vote yet. The Rochester Post editorial said at the time, there can be no justification for such a veto and in exercising it, Governor Austin has displayed the single quality of mulishness. Following that vote, following the initial vote, the paper had said, quote, some weak sisters in the Republican Party were alarmed about the effect upon the party of so progressive a measure. This was the same legislature that earlier in the session had 
voted to approve the 15th Amendment for Negro male voting. One of our local anti-votes was Representative Larson from Byron, a non-citizen from Norway. Until 1896, male non-citizens could vote in any election in Minnesota. All they had to do as they were voting is say they planned to become citizens. Women should have said they planned to become men, and perhaps we could have voted. By the 1870s, Sarah and her husband, a newly appointed judge, moved to Duluth, where she remained an active citizen for at least 30 years. And from there, she founded the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association with 13 other women in 1881. Sarah W. Clark, Mrs. J.B. Clark, in 1870, she was the vice president of the newly formed Rochester Women's Suffrage Association at the same time that Sarah Berger Stearns was the corresponding secretary. She was one of five from Rochester to attend a women's suffrage convention in Chicago in 1870. In 1881, she became notorious. As a widow, owning much property and having a business, she petitioned our state legislature through her senator and representative for, quote, removal of her political disabilities or exemption from taxation. Nothing happened except publicity. Whatever happened to that American slogan, no taxation without representation? That was exactly what she was saying. If I can't vote, I shouldn't be taxed. Repres uh, Reverend Eliza Tupper Wilkes, Mrs. William Wilkes, was the first woman minister in Rochester. In 1871, she was ordained in the Universalist Church. Also in 1871, she was a speaker at a teacher's institute in Iota. She was quoted as saying in the Rochester Post, she spoke, quote, upon France and the lessons of the commune. To avoid a similar fate for our country, she advocated the elevation of woman to the sphere of equality with men, to which she is entitled. And the ability she manifested in enforcing her views was a strong argument in itself in favor of the principles she advocated. There's no comment in the paper on how the speech was received. She had many parishes after Rochester out west, including in California. While there, the state's governor asked her to represent that state at the International Women's Suffrage Congress in Budapest in 1911. Marion Sloan, who in 1856 moved to Rochester as a pioneer child, she was a teacher from thir for 30 years, from 1862 to 1892. In 1905, she was on the executive board of Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association, and she received a commendation for her distinguished services from Carrie Chapman Catt. In 1872, in one of her personal journal entries, she reported a conversation she had had with a cousin who had recently married. You say you have all the rights you want. But did you ever think of the lone girl working alone without a lover to lean on has not all the rights she wants? The woman of the future, will she vote? Doubtless she will, for the nation cannot afford to lose so much intellect. And of course, Edith Graham Mayo, that you all know and love, Mrs. Charles Mayo. In 1880, she wrote her famous 13-year-old essay, now, first of all, women has as good as right to vote as men, and if everything was as it should be, they would vote. The idea of women not knowing enough to hold office, where you see one smart man, you see a dozen smart women. In 1911, she was the first president of our Rochester Civic League. And I believe we will see her as the first president of Rochester's League of Women Voters when it forms probably next year. She has been extremely active, and she uses her place in society for the benefit of our cause. Amelia Hatfield Witherstein, Mrs. Horace Witherstein, is the first woman elected to the Rochester School Board in 1911. She's been the chair ever since 1914. As you all recall, Minnesota women did get the right to vote in school elections in 1875 after 
we weren't allowed a broader franchise. It was the first step, a sort of trial. It's been 44 years, and we're still waiting for more rights. She's also the president of the local Women's Christian Temperance Union chapter for these past 25 years and a leader in so many other groups. Emma Potter Allen, Mrs. George Allen, is the most energetic woman that you could ever meet. From 1917 until now, she's been president of the Minnesota Federation of Women's Clubs and a leader in many local organizations. She is, was especially effective for the Red Cross during the Great War. She uses her ability, organizational skills, to help women in every organization that calls upon her. She organized the final show of support at the legislature for the ratification of the 19th Amendment back in September, sending out 200 invitations to the leaders of the women's organizations throughout the state, and we had a terrific turnout. Naturally, she was one of the honored guests last month at the new League of Women Voters Minnesota as the newly formed League of Women Voters Minnesota celebrated the great victory at our legislature and initiated their new organization. My friends Ella Donna Howard Kilborn, Mrs. Arthur F. Kilborn, who will be attending uh, the meeting in February in Chicago with me, and Chloe Dieta Plank Sinclair, Mrs. E.L. Sinclair, are also very active in the cause. Mrs. Sinclair was quoted in the newspaper as saying, I'm very enthusiastic about it, the right to vote. I'll make use of every opportunity to vote and holding office also. I think the privilege of voting is our birthright, and I believe and I think I express the sentiment of most of the ladies when I say we will stand by the individual most worthy of election regardless of party. She is a wonderful speaker. These two women are also active in the GOP, and they are expecting to be named county delegates in 1920 when the party opens to women mentor members. They, of course, are also very active in civic church and women's groups. Jessie Van Shake Predmore, Mrs. Charles Predmore, who lives in Cascade Township, she was quoted in the Rochester Post as saying, I am for the amendment, and I wanted the privilege even if I didn't use it. It seemed a degradation to be denied the franchise, and I will take care of that privilege at however. She's the chair of the local women's division of the Liberty Loan Campaign. I have to admit, she outraised my husband, J. Arthur Malone. He was in charge of the man in the city of Rochester. She received a commendation from the wife of the Secretary of the Treasury. She's a real do-it-yourself woman who, with women friends, their wagons and teams, regraded the Hadley Valley and Lake City Roads, having waited forever for the township to do it. She's also a member of many women's organizations, including the Douglas Progress Club. Anne E. Rice, she shared with us the 1916 and 1917 copies of the headquarters newsletter that I have here, published by the National American Women's Suffrage Association in New York City. She is a resident of Orinoco. She was a teacher in Byron, and in 1910, an Orinoco newspaper ran a contest for the most popular lady. She was one of the nominees. I wouldn't be surprised if we see her as the first woman justice of the peace in our county. Several of these women that I've mentioned have husbands who were prominent in local politics, mayor, county attorney, city attorney, party delegate, so they were exposed throughout their lives to all kinds of political talk. And no wonder they wanted to have their voices really count. Other women I know who are supporters of our cause here in Rochester include Mrs. C.A. Chapman, Mrs. C.E. Callahan, Mrs. W.F. Brosh, Mrs. Franklin Smith, Mrs. T.R. Harney, Mrs. Clarence Stearns, Mrs. Fred Harvey, Mrs. Frederick Case, Mrs. W.J. Quinlan, Mrs. J.P. Anderson, Mrs. C.T. Granger, Mrs. Thomas Phelps, Mrs. Emil Beckman, Mrs. George Sherman, Mrs. Jacob Genuine, Mrs. Daniel Madden, Mrs. Frederick Rommel, Mrs. A.C. Gooding, of course, wife of our senator, Mrs. Carrie Conley, and of course, the Tourist Club 
who call themselves suffragettes and refuse to have their names, the officers' names, published in the newspaper under their husbands' names. They are Mrs. Emma Allen, Mrs. Dolly Joslin, Mrs. Francinia Irish, and Mrs. Bertha Blickle. I do have to tell you, however, there are some Rochester women who aren't ready to commit yet to votes for women. Mrs. Christopher Graham is quoted as saying, I haven't made up my mind whether I favor the amendment. I'm not keen on politics. Mrs. Harry Harwick has stated, I'm in favor of women voting, but I'm not really a suffragette. Mrs. Dan Mackin, I haven't decided yet whether I favor women's suffrage or not. I shall cast my ballot, all right, but I don't believe that women should go into politics deep enough to neglect their homes. Don't worry, we will bring them around. These are just short sketches on my current and former suffrage sisters. But most of all, I want to urge all of you to make use of this hard-won right of citizenship. Join me in the League of Women Voters to promote democracy. Exercise the vote at every opportunity. Avail yourself to the broadest information possible so that you are truly an informed voter. Celebrate our democracy by making it work. Today, women voters, tomorrow women elected officials, and a changed world. And surely, it will take less than 70 years to finish the job for women's equality and pass an Equal Rights Amendment. 